Thanks for uh, taking the time to Absolutely. talk to us. Absolutely. So it'd be really nice if you were generous to the local <laughs> news guy and broke some news today and answered the question everybody's asking, are you going to run for president in 2020? I do not know. I'm sorry. So w why not run? What would be the argument against running? I mean, everybody else is at this point. So. <laughs> I don't think you run for an office because it's available. I think you run because you're the best person, because it's the right time, and because you want to do that job. Now, I do want to do that job. I don't know that I want to do it now. And part of what I want to understand is whether the candidates we have really perform the way I think they will. And right now we've got a very solid set of candidates. I think they are saying the right things, but I think it's early. And for me to enter the race, it's going to be because I think I'm the best person. And that means I need to see what's happening. But I also have to make other de decisions about what I want to do with my life. And the Senate is the most immediate conversation that I'm having. Okay, now you have said that the Democrats need to focus on winning America, not necessarily on beating Donald Trump. Absolutely. Which one of the Democrats in the race is doing the best job of that right now in your estimation? I'm not gonna answer that. And, and here's why, because we're early in the campaign and I think part of what happens when campaigns start so quickly is that we only know what we hear from whichever show we happen to be watching at the moment. I do think that we're seeing credible, thoughtful policies coming out of most of those candidates. I think we're hearing good responses to queries and by and large, I am happy with the entire field. I've had a chance to meet eight of them. Uh, I'm friends with or know a couple of others who are either running or thinking about running. And so I do think we've got the right field of candidates as of now, but we have to see what happens as the race plays out. Okay, you mentioned the U.S. Senate. Some Georgia Democrats are waiting on the sidelines to see what you're going to do. When are you gonna tell them? So I've said to every candidate who's reached out to me or every potential candidate, please feel free to make your announcement, but it would be disingenuous for me to not recognize that would, were I to enter the race, that has an effect. I have infrastructure in place from the last campaign I ran, and I appreciate the, the recognition and the respect. But my intention is to make a decision very quickly in the next few weeks. Part of what happened was when I initially decided to make a decision by the end of March, my publisher hadn't decided to release my paperback. Right. And the last time my book came out, I did not do a great job of promoting it because I was running for governor. And so because this is my job right now, my responsibility is to make certain I'm promoting my book and that's been my primary responsibility. But I am gonna make a decision fairly soon. Okay, I I've watched a lot of interviews of you during this book tour. Uh, and it seems to me that you're much more excited about being an executive, a governor or president, than about being one of 100 senators. Is that is that a fair observation or that, not? That's a fair observation that I've focused most of my work on the executive side and I think that there is more immediate return on the work that I need to do. But having served in the legislative body, I understand how important uh, a senator can be. And that's really what's what, what I'm grappling with, that a U.S. senator has a very specific opportunity to articulate issues, to speak to a national audience, and to have effect to move legislation but also to move issues. And so while I've never thought about the legislative process on a national level, I'd never thought about running for the Senate, I have wanted to give myself time to really think about what that looks like. I'm a, I'm a bit of a planner. And right. so part of my process has been really pushing through what would this look like? How would I leverage this position and this platform? But it is different. I've long been thinking about the executive side, not the legislative side. Yeah, ideally, from your perspective, you would have been governor for eight years and no one would have had any question about whether you were qualified to be president. Correct. Do you, do you feel as though you're qualified now? Absolutely. Uh, the job of being the, the leader of the United States is one of having the insight to understand what challenges we face, the management capacity to not only manage a cabinet, but to hire the right people a very strong familiarity with our foreign policy, but the ability, again, to hire experts who can do a deeper dive and to have a deep love of this country that's matched with an intellectual capacity to, to lead it, and I have those things. If you decide to wait until 2022 to run for governor again, uh, how do you stay relevant with the issues that you care about? Poverty, health care, uh, education, voter suppression, uh, during the intervening three and a half years? What I've done my entire life is work on three dimensions, the public sector, the private sector, the nonprofit sector. I do not see a conflict in doing those things and I would continue to do all three. Now whether I'm holding elected office is a question, but were I not in elected office, I would continue to do the work I've been doing. We've launched the New Georgia Project, it's now its own standalone organization, but in recent months I launched the Fair Fight Action, which is focusing on voter suppression and voter integrity. That's not an issue that's gonna be resolved in a matter of months. 
but we've also launched Fair Count, which is going to look at the census for 2020 and beyond. But more than that, I'm going to continue to have conversations about how we address policy issues. How do we think about poverty in Georgia and across the South? How do we take some of these great ideas and innovations that are coming out of other parts of the country, but make them relevant to Georgia and relevant to the South? And that's something that I've always worked on and I will continue to work on. You don't have to be in elected office to have an impact on public policy. And I'll continue to do the work in all three dimensions. Okay. And I need to make a living, so I'll stay in the private sector too. There you go. Now, in the midterm, you got 85,000 more votes than Hillary Clinton got during the presidential campaign in mm -hmm. Georgia in 2016. Mm -hmm. So whatever voter suppression there was, a lot of your voters were not suppressed. Uh, do you have any second thoughts about not having given a full-throated concession to Brian Kemp? So we have to disconnect those two. Increased voter participation does not diminish voter suppression. The capacity of voters in the state of Georgia is 6 million votes. So the fact that 3.8 million showed up does not mean that thousands and hundreds of thousands more weren't suppressed. And it's a very disingenuous argument to correlate the two. What is real is that we had 1.5 million purged. What is real is that we had 214 precincts shut down under his leadership. What is real is about 53,000 people who were put on a pending list, that we had thousands of absentee ballots either never delivered or discounted and thrown out. Those are all real facets of voter suppression. And my responsibility as a candidate is to say that if I see a problem with the process, I should articulate it. I did not challenge the outcome of the election. There was a legal mechanism. I chose not to use it right. because I acknowledge the legal outcome. But as a citizen who believes in our democracy, I cannot condone the erosion of the process under Brian Kemp's leadership. Had it been a fair fight, do you think you would have won? I think so, but I don't have empirical proof of that, and that's why I won't claim that I know. Okay. The, the new voting machines are going to be like the old ones, except they're going to spit out a paper trail, a paper ballot. Not what you wanted, which was a paper ballot all by itself, but is it better? No, because right now it's going to spit out a paper trail that's written in barcode. I don't speak Valerian, I don't speak Klingon, and I don't speak barcode. This is problematic because the average citizen will not know that their vote is being accurately recorded because they cannot read the paper trail. An audit is only valid if it actually shows you what you did. The new director of the state ethics uh, division has said, uh, that they're going to open an investigation of your campaign. Your top eight, I want to make sure I get it right, called this insane political posturing. Is, is that your opinion? I would agree. We don't, know what's, we don't know what the question is because no one's asked. We have always timely filed our reports. We have worked closely when they were questioned. I've been transparent and open. And if anyone had said there was an issue, we would be happy to be responsive. In fact, we had our attorneys reach out to Mr. Amati because he never reached out to us. This is posturing because he is an adjutant of the current governor who, for some reason, has targeted our campaign without asking for information, without following the proper protocols, and without doing the basics of communicating with us. We will answer questions, but someone has to ask. Okay. You have said you're in favor of reparations for African Americans and Native Americans. Yes. How do you decide who gets what and from whom? We don't know, and, I, and that's part of the issue. As a nation, we haven't fully grappled with what the economic consequences of slavery and Jim Crow and the ostracization and isolation of the Native American populations has been. And because we haven't had the conversation, we've never gotten to the space of actually having the discussion about who would be covered, how they would be covered. And until we as a nation grapple with that in real terms, then we cannot, I think, fully satisfy the disinvestment that we've had in these communities and the long-term effects of our policies. Do you think this new heartbeat law in Georgia, uh, further restricting abortion to six weeks, will pass constitutional muster? I do not believe it passes constitutional muster, but unfortunately we have seen a reconstitution of our Supreme Court that does not put into, I think, absolute clarity that we have members of the Supreme Court who will follow what I believe the Constitution says. I believe that Roe v. Wade set the right parameters and I believe that any diminution of a right to privacy that may come out of the Supreme Court is wrong. But more importantly, I think 481 is an abomination. It is a restriction of a woman's bodily autonomy. It is a forced pregnancy bill, and it is bad for our state. We are a state that has often prided itself on the fact that we are a more moderate state. Not, it's not a question of whether we're conservative or progressive, but in our execution of our laws, we've always been moderated. We do things because they're necessary, not because they're available. 
and this bill is not necessary. It is stripping women of their rights and doing so for purely political reasons, and that is deeply disturbing to me. Okay. One of the big political issues, of course, in this upcoming presidential, cam presidential campaign is going to be immigration. Mm -hmm. What would be a sane compromise to treat people who are coming here in a humane way and at the same time have some control over our southern border? Absolutely. There is not a single person of, of good conscience who doesn't believe that immigration means that we have to treat people humanely, but we also have to protect our borders. No one is arguing against the protection of our borders. What we are saying, though, is that stripping people of their humanity, putting them in tent cities, separating them from their children, that those are not only inhumane, but they're also ineffective. They diminish us in the, in the world's eyes, but they also diminish us in the eyes of our fellow citizens. We are better people than this. We do not do this to other humans, and that's the problem I have with our policy. But it's also a federal responsibility, and unfortunately our current senator seems to have no interest in actually moving us forward in that conversation of immigration, and I think we need leadership who will. So what's the compromise? I mean, I know it's complicated, but in a Cliff Notes version, what's the compromise? We need to have federal immigration policy that resolves the current status of those who are in the United States, that continues to invest in thoughtful, rational, and reasonable security measures, but that also recognizes that the United States is going to continue to need to access labor from outside the U.S. Right. and creates a process that is expedient and useful and actually bolsters our ability to be a productive country. Okay. Last question. Okay. You've said that you, you're, you've said your grandmother told you she'd be watching you. Yes. So how do you think she wants you to carry this fight forward? My grandmother raised six, five children, uh, one of whom is my dad. And my other grandparents, I think, were always involved with my grandmother's the last surviving grandparent I had who, who's recently passed away. I think she wants to know that I'm fighting for the vulnerable, that I'm speaking up for the 1.9 million who voted for me, but I'm also speaking up for the 1.9 million who didn't vote for me. Because our democracy isn't partisan, it's people. And my responsibility is to make certain that our democracy works in every county, in every community, and in every state. So you're going to make a decision about the U.S. Senate in the next two weeks? I'm going to make it shortly. Shortly. Yes. We'll look forward to it. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Very much.